Well, good morning. We are walking through a series, as you saw, about asking kind of God questions. Is God fill in the blank? And we ask God questions all the time. We, we, this, is, this isn't novel. It's okay to ask God questions, right? And today we're asking, is God exclusive? Is God exclusive? This is a, a question that I think makes many of us feel uncomfortable, largely because we live in a culture that has taught us again and again and again how essential it is to have a backup plan. Have something to fall back on. How many of you got a degree and got a minor in something else to have a backup plan? When you've applied to jobs, do you ever just send your application or your resume to one job? No, you canvas. In any, any place of the help wanted sign out front, you're like, yeah, sure, I'll give it a shot. When you are going to prom, you have your first choice. And then you have a backup plan. And trust me, I know what it's like to be somebody's backup plan. <laughs> and I was a great backup. Thank you very much. It's excellent. We live in a society that really encourages the idea of fallback options and backup plans. You, you, you want to be able to, to not be caught out. You want to be able to, to have something, like I said, to fall back on. And it makes us uncomfortable. We feel out there if we aren't able to have that thing to fall back on. And normally that's a good thing. I don't have a problem with people having plans. I, th I think the world probably runs with you people who not just have plan A, plan B, and plan C, but you've got the entire alphabet covered. And for those of us that like to fly by the seat of our pants, we thank you. Because you let us do what we want to do. But Jesus is exclusive. He wants to be your only plan. And today I want to talk about why that's actually a good thing. Why it's a good thing. And so we're going to be in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. And I want to talk first about why does exclusivity seem bad. I want to dive into that pretty deeply. And then I want to talk about why it's good and then why it's necessary. So why does it seem bad? Why is it good? And then why is it necessary? So first, looking at John chapter 14, verse 1. Why does exclusivity seem bad? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in God me. Jesus is in the middle of uh, the upper room discourse, the upper room conversation with his disciples from John chapter 13 until 17. He is talking to his disciples and it is an incredibly uncomfortable affair. It's very awkward. A lot of uh, uh, intrigue, a lot of suspense, so much so that the band U2 even wrote a song about it. There's a lot going on here. And it starts off incredibly awkward. Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. Now we read this and we think this would have been like a short sort of, okay, it's kind of uncomfortable, but we're going to get through it kind of thing. Again, there's at least 12 men in the room. And Jesus is washing each of them. He's stripped down to the waist. He's doing something he shouldn't be doing. Have you ever seen uh, one of those episodes of The Office? where it's incredibly awkward and you're like, I don't want to watch this because it's uncomfortable and then they just keep going and it gets worse and worse and worse. That's what this would have been like. This un it's so uncomfortable that, that Peter just starts blurting things out. Like, Lord, give me a bath too. Like, why would you say that? It's so weird. Just starts blurting things out. He then tells them something even more troubling than what he just did. He tells them, one of you is going to betray me. Oh, and Peter, by the way, you who uh, are the leader of this whole disciple group here, you, you're going to deny that you even know me. That's incredibly troubling. He then goes on past this point. He talks about he's leaving and, and going away. They're going to be sad. The world's going to rejoice. The Spirit of God is going to come upon them, the Comforter. He goes on and on and on talking about them. They have absolutely every reason to be troubled to be concerned. The Greek word is terrazzo. It means to be stirred up or to be confused. All of this bad news is throwing their minds into confusion. And I think you can make a good argument that these men might be going through a, a kind of emotional shock. Because think about it. Just five days before this, 
they were leading a, a triumphal entry. They were a part of this proclamation that, that Jesus is the Messiah. Like, we've struggled with this guy for three years. We've had to put up with the Pharisees and the religious leaders and all this stuff, all the while believing that this is the guy. And finally, he's going to show himself to be exactly what we think he is. And then he brings us into this room and he's like, this is not going to go the way you think it is. I think you can make an argument that they're in shock. In fact, I looked up the symptoms of shock this week. You can't think straight. If you read through this passage, the questions that the disciples ask, I understand that a lot of the time they don't understand what Jesus is saying, but they seem particularly dense during this conversation. Lord, we don't understand. We don't know what's going on. When you're in shock, fight or flight kicks in. Fight, flight, or freeze. When Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, what happens? They run. They scatter. They're strangely exhausted. When you're, when you're in shock, you, you, it, it, you, simultaneously you can't sleep, but you're also tired all the time. And so what happens in, in the Garden of Gethsemane? They can't stay awake. They fall asleep. They can't stay awake to pray. They just fall asleep. They're inconsistent. Inconsistency is a big part of shock. Peter goes from, I'm going to strike the ear off of a, 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 one of the, the priest's servants, when Jesus comes to get arrested, he hits a man with the head with a sword, okay? It's a pretty bold move. Just a few hours later, he's like, I don't even know this guy. So you're willing on one hand to fight and die in a dark place for him, but six hours later, you're not willing to admit that you know him? Like, what's going on? That's inconsistent. That's the kind of inconsistency that you might see in shock. And then lastly, there's just a sense of emptiness. Look at Thomas. In chapter 11, Thomas says, we're going to go and we're going to die with Jesus. And then after Jesus' death, he's not there for the, for, to see him the first time uh, he, introduces, he reintroduces himself to the disciples after the resurrection. And Thomas says, I don't even believe it. He's empty. And so it's kind of emotional, spiritual shock they're going through. And Jesus tells them to do something. What does he tell them to do? Look back at verse 1. Believe in God, believe also in me. Now, like the ESV, uh, I think it's a good translation. I would, all the translations that I saw choose believe. And I don't like believe here just because um, we tend to think in English believe just means, okay, assent to a a fact. So like believe what Jesus is about to say. But I think it goes deeper than that. I, I think it's trust me. Trust me. Trust God. Trust me. Give me your trust. He tells them this very simply. It's a simple fact to address this sort of shock that they're in. He doesn't give them something hard to do. He doesn't doesn't tell them all these theological truths he's about to. He's about to dive into a lot of things. But the first thing he says is, no, 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 you're going to trust me. This is foundational. When When a child is upset, and they're breathing, and they're, <gasps> what do you tell a child that's crying so hard that they start gasping? What do you say? You've got to breathe, breathe. Trusting God, trusting in Christ is a simple, basic act, like breathing. It's the spiritual equivalent of breathing. This is something that they would have been familiar with, right? They're Jewish men. They've been taught since they were little, trust God, trust in Yahweh. He's going to deliver us. Trust him. They've been taught for the last three years, trust Jesus, trust Jesus. It's as simple as breathing. He's trying to get them back to the foundations, to the basics. But we need to be aware of something right here. It's it's very foundational for us to understand what's going on here. None of this would be happening to the disciples if it wasn't for Jesus. None of it. They wouldn't be struggling like this. They wouldn't be worried about this. They wouldn't be in this low-lit room trying to figure out what this man is saying. They wouldn't be under uh, the stress of possibly being arrested. None of this would be happening if it wasn't for Jesus. Peter, James, John, Andrew would be on a lake somewhere with their parents fishing. Matthew would be collecting taxes. Simon the Zealot would probably be planning an assassination. They would all be doing something other than being vulnerable in this place. It is Jesus's, it is their connection to Jesus that does this. By associating with Jesus, they've painted a target on their back, one that for most of them gets them killed. All of them except for John will be killed. That's a 92% casualty rate, by the way, if you want to do the math. 
There's no fallback options here. There's no, there's no uh, secondary plan. They have committed their way to Jesus. They've committed their lives to him. They said, this is where we're going. This is what we're doing. There's no fallback option here. There's no secondary plan here. Peter even tells him in the rich young ruler story, we have left everything to follow you. The disciples aren't exploring their options. This isn't a phase they're going through. This is exclusivity. This is what it looks like. This is what it is. And this is why it seems bad to us. Because look at how exposed these men are. Look at how vulnerable they are. They don't have options. This is what commitment and allegiance looks like. And it's scary to us. It makes us feel vulnerable. It's restricting. We don't like the idea of our only option, being confined to an only option. Why do you think it takes people so much longer? Why do you think young people are getting married so much later now than people in previous generations did? It's the fear of vulnerability. It's the fear of exclusivity. Not that they want to date around. It's just they understand that when I commit myself to this person, there's no fallback options in marriage. You don't have a plan B, like if this person doesn't work out on my way to prom, I'm going to, no, you can't have a plan B in marriage. I mean, I guess you could, but I don't think that's going to set your marriage up for success. They've committed themselves. And when you commit yourself to something, you become vulnerable. This is why people are so broken and sad when their longtime spouse leaves or passes away because they've committed themselves exclusively to this person. Exclusivity leaves us vulnerable. And it's one of the reasons why we don't like Jesus' exclusivity claims on our life. We want Jesus. We want him to be one of our options. We just don't want him to be our only option. And some of us, even the most righteous among us, will make Jesus our first option. Be like, yes, Jesus, we're worshiping you. We're going to put you first in our life and put you first in our family. I don't think Jesus wants to be first in your life. I don't. I think he wants to be your only. I think he wants to be your only. We talk about putting him first. That implies that there's a second. Jesus says himself, if you're going to follow me, you've got to hate your mother and your father. Now, that's a little bit of hyperbolic language, right? At least that's what we like to tell ourselves. I think Jesus is saying that you need everything you need, everything you need to figure out how to love your mom, how to love your dad, you figure it out through me. We don't like that claim to exclusivity. So there's two, two options that you have here if you want to follow Jesus. And one is for people that are going through a crisis right now and one that are not going through a crisis right now. Let's start with the people who aren't going through a crisis. You have a luxury that the people going through a crisis don't have, and it's called time. It's called time. You have time now to learn to trust Jesus. You have time now to put your faith in him, to build trust in him, to grow closer to him. You have time to do that so that when the crisis hit, so that when the struggles come, and he puts out that nail-scarred hands and he says, trust me, you can say, I have been and I will keep doing so. And you can take that hand. You have the opportunity now to grow in Christ now. You don't feel the need because there's, there's not a lot going wrong in your life. But it's there. Christianity is a communal faith. It is built upon the testimony of witnesses. What do we call our gospels? What are they called? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You know why they're called that? Because we're saying that these are the people who testified to the things they saw or the things that they were reported after they did a lot of research. They're named after people. They are witness accounts from people. The Christian faith is a faith based on witness, which is critical. Because if we're going to be Christians today, we need to let other people bear witness to how God has worked in their life. This is why you need to be in community. This is why you need a connect group. You need to listen to how people talk about how God has moved in their life. So when that bad thing happens to you, you can be like, oh my gosh, that person in my group, they went through the same thing. I'm going to call them up because they know what it's like to go through this. And they told me how God worked in their life. It's a testimony. It's a witness. 
You need to be in the Word. You spend time with God. Day in and day out. Let me ask you this. Let's say that tomorrow, the worst thing you can think happens, happens to you tomorrow. Some of you are like, it's Monday. Of course, that's like weekly. Worst thing possible happens to you tomorrow. Think about your last three years. The disciples were with Jesus for three years, so I'll give you three years. Does your time with the Lord for the last three years, would you think that that would prepare you for that thing happening to you tomorrow or not? That's how you know. What are you worried about? What are you anxious about? What do you can't stop thinking about? Where's the first place you take things? Is it to the Lord or is it somewhere else? Now, for those of you who are in the middle of a crisis, the earthquakes hit in your life, the, the troubles have happened. What, Travis, I don't have time. What do I do? Well, Jesus still is before you and he still says, trust me. And what we start to think is, we're like, oh my gosh, I've got this whole long process to go through. It's a cancer diagnosis. It's a long treatment. There's a lot of struggles here. We're going to be in the hospital for a little bit. You start thinking about it. Or, or my, my, my kids or my grandkids have turned away from the faith, and, and, and I don't know when they're coming. It's so hard to trust you, Jesus. It's so hard to think about what's going to happen next and what their life is going to be like and all this other stuff. Remember what Jesus says. He says, trust me. And we likened it to breathing. Most of us don't worry about whether or not we're going to be breathing in the next, like, six years. We're concerned with our next breath. And now all of you are thinking about breathing, right? That's all you're thinking about. Breathing, if I'm breathing now, I'm okay. Give Jesus this moment. Give Jesus this day. Worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you today. And then tomorrow rolls around and you do the same thing again and again and again. And you watch the crop of faith sprout up in your life amidst the storm. Exclusivity seems bad to us until you're drowning and somebody throws you a life preserver and it's your only means of salvation. That life preserver seems pretty good. We don't mind exclusivity then. Turn to Christ. Give him your life. Trust him with the difficult things you're going through. Trust him with the difficult things you might go through. I know it makes you vulnerable. Well, we can trust him with that. So that's why it seems bad. It seems bad because it exposes us. So why is it good, Travis? Why is it a good thing? Look at verse 2. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus gives reasons now why his exclusivity is good. And it has to do with the fact that he's going to prepare a place for you. And he's saying, in God's kingdom, there's room, there's space. And so because many of us grew up maybe reading the King James or we've heard a song uh, that uses the word mansions here, we think of, oh, Jesus is going to build me like a really nice house. That's, that's probably not what's happening here. I'm not saying there's not mansions in heaven. I'm just saying you can't really get it from this passage. He's saying there's room. He's saying there's space for you in the kingdom. And he says when he go to prepare a place for you, he's saying that I am how you get there. I'm the means by which you get to that place. Jesus is not going to make a cosmic B&B for us. That's not what this passage is referring to. He's not putting a little mint on your pillow. There's little Andy's mint right there waiting on you when you enter the kingdom of heaven. He's making sure that you know that he is exclusively the way by which you access the kingdom of God. John 10 tells us that he is the good shepherd and he is the door of the sheep. And you know what I think is really interesting in this passage? And I never noticed it until I started reading it this week, is how Jesus makes a claim on his own integrity. He says, if this wasn't happening, if, 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 if I wasn't going to do this, would I have told you? This is, this is so human of Jesus. I think it's one of the most, like, that I've read recently, it's one of the most human things I think he does. He says, guys, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't lie to you like this. I wouldn't mislead you. You can trust me. It sounds so casual and so heartfelt, right? You believed me in a time of trouble. You can believe me now. And then he reaffirms his graciousness, and I'll explain what I mean by that. 
in a minute, but he is asking a lot of his disciples. You know what he's telling his disciples? He's saying there's going to be long-term gain, but there's going to be short-term struggles, short-term pain, short-term frustration, but the long-term is going to be worth it. There's going to be turbulence, tribulation in your lives. It's going to hurt, but it's going to be worth it in the end. And it's a good thing. And the reason why it's a good thing is it's a good thing because of what's being asked. This is where Jesus' graciousness comes in. Notice what Jesus says to the disciples. He says, and if I go there, I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you with me. This is amazing. It's amazing because Jesus doesn't say, hey, I'm going to the kingdom. I'm going to go to heaven and you guys meet me there. Figure out however you guys want to get there. It's fine. Just you guys figure out, I'll make sure the door's open. I'll leave a light on for you. We'll have a little candle burning. It's going to be great. I'll make sure the stove is warm. We're going to have dinner on the table. But you all figure out, humanity, figure out how to get to me, how to get to God. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, you know what? Maybe you should try some pilgrimages or maybe try being a good person or maybe try that. I don't know. It's not some cosmic game of Marco Polo where we call out to Jesus and he says our name and we try to blindly thumb our way through existence. He also makes it incredibly simple. He doesn't make it this elaborate scheme. Not like some uh, uh, pyramid scheme of religion that gets you to heaven. He doesn't say, okay, you're a level one disciple. A level one disciple trusts in me. A level two disciple, you're going to bring three friends to the next worship service. And then after that, to be a level three disciple, you're going to go see the Bishop of Antioch. Now, the Bishop of Antioch is going to give you uh, a new identity and a new name. And then you're going to go to the Bishop of Rome. And the Bishop of Rome, he is going to confer on you the Holy Spirit, and then you'll be ready for heaven. Praise God he doesn't do that. That's a lot of traveling, and tickets are expensive. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. So many of us treat our spiritual lives like some kind of cosmic spiritual scavenger hunt where you feel like God's giving you this list of things you're supposed to collect. Daily devotionals, go to church, be nice, give occasionally. Okay, a lot occasionally. Like, and what we do is we, 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 we have this list And all of us looks different because we all emphasize different things based on our temperaments and our personalities and the things we like and the things we have and the things we do and the things we don't like and the things we don't do. Our definition of being a nice person in our culture is not overstaying your welcome, right? In Western society, you do not overstay your welcome. My father-in-law says that guests are like fish. After three days, they stink. It's brilliant. It's very wise. But in other cultures, to refuse hospitality like that is incredibly rude. So what's just being nice? What's being a good person? We don't know. So we're just out there blindly trying to figure it out, trying to collect the trinkets, trying to collect the things that you think are going to make you worthy of heaven, to, to find your way into the kingdom. And Jesus is like, oh, you made it. Great. Yeah, that's great. You picked up all that stuff on the way. Fantastic. Cool. That'll let you in. Most of us think it's being a good person. Most of us think attending a service. Most of us think it's being charitable. Most of us think we need to engage in some kind of a tradition. The older, the better. So, guys, I've got good news. Since we're in this room, we're a whole lot holier than the people down down the road there. (laughs) Although, we lost points today because we had a guitar. Sorry. (laughs) Can I just be honest about something? Whatever that is sounds exhausting. It sounds daunting. It sounds overwhelming. And as somebody who's not very good at keeping things organized, it sounds impossible. And what's really difficult is there's nobody telling us what's more important than the other thing. There's nothing, I mean, I don't care how good your study Bible is. There's nothing in the back that tells you how God keeps score. There's nothing there that tells you being, giving a dollar to a homeless guy gets you one point and going to church on Sunday gets you five points. And if it's a Baptist church, it gets you 10. There's none of that. There's no scorecard. 
And so we don't know. I have a, I have a, a friend that, that's got a final exam, and they mentioned this week, they're like, I'm doing so well in the class, I just want to graduate. It's 5% of my grade. I don't care. I might just blow it off. We don't know what to blow off. We don't know what to emphasize and what to not. I heard a comedian talk about this. It's like filing your taxes. Filing your taxes. We, 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 the government comes to us, and the government says, hey, you owe us money. And we say, okay, great. How much do we owe you? And the government very graciously comes back and says, guess. You tell us. What other entity in the world has so many people indebted to them and yet doesn't tell them how much they owe? And if we get it wrong, we get in trouble. And that's like so many of us live our spiritual lives. We think God has demanded so much of us to be acceptable to him. And we say, God, how do I do it all? And so many of us believe that God looks at us and says, guess, figure it out. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And this is the beauty of exclusivity. It's simple. It's simple. We love simple. You know how I know we love simple? There are probably many people in this room that can change their own car oil. And you probably haven't done it in forever. You know why? It's simple. Take it, to the, take it to the person down the street. They'll charge you like 25 bucks. You can even sit there and look at your phone while they do it. You don't have to get your hands dirty and you drive off. And it's simple. You know why Walmart is successful? You know why Amazon is successful? It's simple. It's a one-stop shop. I can get food, sweatpants, and a TV in the same place. And then when I get home, I can watch the TV in my sweatpants eating my food. It's glorious. That's why it's successful, because it's simple. Jesus is a one-stop shop. You come to me, he says, and I will take you there. I will take you to the kingdom. I'll take you as far as you need to go, because he's the way. He is the simple path. Everything else is exhausting. Forget about the fact that it doesn't work. It's just easier to go to Christ. There's no guesswork involved. He has done everything. So that's why exclusivity is good. But Travis, why is it necessary? Why did he have to make it this way? It's a good question. Verse four, verse four, and you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus makes a statement. You know where I'm going. You know the way, excuse me, you know the way to where I'm going. And I'd like to think that Peter probably had his mouth full of food at this point, because usually this is something that Peter would say. And Thomas chimes in, he's like, hold on, buddy, I got this one. We don't know where you're going. It just sounds like a Peter thing, right? And Jesus says plainly, yeah, you know the way. You know why you know the way? Because you know me. He gives us three statements. They're probably equal. Some people think that the last two should be subordinate to the first. I think they're all equal. Way, truth, life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Everything you need. This is a claim to exclusivity. Not just the I am the way. We get focused on the, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We get focused on those ideas. But the three of those things together makes a broader claim to exclusivity. He's saying, I am all that you need. What more do you need? You need to know how, where you're going, you need your way, you need truth, and you need life. That's what we need, to be thriving, flourishing human beings. Jesus isn't just making an exclusivity to be the only way to heaven, the only way to the Father. He's saying he's the only way to live. His claims here are much bigger than getting into heaven. His claim is, I am all that you need for life, to breathe, to function, to be everything I've created you to be. And we read this and we think, oh, I'm the way. Like Jesus is like a pathway. He's like this aisle right here and I'll walk up and down it and it's fine. No, no, no. Jesus is the way in the same way that you might say, hey, I'm going to Europe and I'm going to take a plane to get there. He's the plane. It's not, it, you don't work hard to get when you're flying. I mean, you got to go through TSA. Other than that, it's not super hard. You just sit there and wait and pray nobody starts crying. And then you get there and it's happy and fine. You don't work especially hard. 
And this is problematic for many of us. We don't like the necessity of Jesus being the only way, and here's why. Because we all have friends, we have family members, we have people around the globe that we wonder, well, Travis, what happens to them if they don't believe? And we ask that question because I think genuinely we love people. We care about people. But we've made the mistake thinking that maybe we care about them more than God does. And that's simply not true. We want a universal faith. We want a pluralistic approach. We do. Because we think it would be easier. But I'll tell you why it doesn't work. I'll tell you why that idea doesn't work. There's a stone in Rome. And it's in the Roman Forum. And supposedly, according to legend, Augustus Caesar put it there about 20 years before Jesus was born. And apparently, every single road connects to that rock. So if you go on the road anywhere in the Roman Empire, if you were to start walking, you would eventually wind up at that rock, which is where we get the expression, all roads lead to Rome. Right, very good. And so we have applied this idea of all roads lead to Rome to religion. And we've said, well, generally everything's, I mean, eventually we're all going to connect to God anyway. Eventually we're all going to make it. All roads lead to Rome, to God. Here's the problem. We don't really think that. Because when you say that all religions lead to God, you only mean certain religions that we approve of as a society. If my religion is cannibalism and child sacrifice, you're like, well, maybe that's a dead end. That road's probably not going to get you to God, right? And that shows the cracks in the all roads theory. And here's the crack. The crack is this. You and I can't get anywhere in this world, on this planet, physically, without listening to somebody who has been there before. Okay, so before the advent of Google Maps, if I wanted to go visit a friend or I wanted to go meet somewhere and I'd never been there before, I had to pick up the phone and actually call them and say, hey, how do I get to your house? And they'd say, okay, you're gonna go to the third stop sign, you're gonna take a left, and we're X number on the right. Okay, great, thanks, I'll be there soon. And then you'd hang out the phone and if you got lost, guess what, you didn't have a cell phone. So you just drove around. And I think there's probably still people driving around to this day trying to find their friend. That was a joke, a really (laughs) poor one. And then you say, oh, well, Travis, there's Google Maps now, right? The reason why that person, that friend could help us was because they'd been there. They lived there. They'd, They'd been to that place before. They could walk us through it. And you say, well, Travis, there's Google Maps now. Well, guess what? That satellite that took those pictures, technologically, it's been there first. It has seen it first. And it is then telling us how to get there. It's been there first. It's been there first. It is so foolish of us to think we who can't even tell each other how to get someplace unless we've been there before to tell one another how to get to heaven when we've never been there. That is the most asinine, foolish idea. And what does Jesus say here? Jesus says, I'm returning to the Father. You know what return means? You don't need to know Greek. It means he's going back. It means he's been there before. He can tell us the way because he's been there. He knows the pathway. The reason why he can say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life is because he's been there. He's speaking as someone who has come from heaven. He is the valid way because he's been there. It wasn't the other other cities in the Roman Empire that said, oh, you connect to us. We're, it's not all roads lead to Athens. It's not all roads lead to, to Philippi or Jerusalem. That's not what's said. It was Rome. And what was it that made Rome so significant? It was that the emperor put the stone there. That's where he put it. And that's what made that rock so significant. The emperor was the one that said, everything goes through here. And in the same way, our emperor, our king, God himself, has taken a stone and laid it in the kingdom of heaven. Psalm 118, 22 is quoted five times in the New Testament. The stone the builder rejected has become the capstone. God has laid the stone of Jesus Christ in the kingdom of heaven, and he said, all roads lead through here. You've got to connect to him. You've got to connect here. And if you don't connect to here, if you don't trust him, if you don't believe in him, then your road doesn't go anywhere. But if you want to be a part of the kingdom, you connect to the stone, to the rock, to the way, the truth, and the life. He has to be the way. Why? Because we were lost. We're trying to figure our way out. 
and we can't because we've never been there before and because we're burdened with sin, brokenness. So he becomes the way because he was never lost, but he, he got lost for our sake on the cross. Why is he the truth? Because we believe so many lies and we tell so many lies. We try to convince everybody we're worth it. We try to bring our scavenge hunt t- trinkets up before everybody. And we're like, look how good of a person I am. Oh, look how good of a person you are. I wish I was better, more like you. And it's just flashy things. It's like, it's like a, a fish with flashy scales trying to convince everybody that they're really important. He's the life because he gave up his life so that we could have it. You want to know what today's application is? No matter where you are in your faith, whether you have faith, you don't have faith, whether you're the most devoted follower of Jesus Christ or you can't stand the thought, today's application is this. Connect your life. Every single road in the city that is your existence, connect it to the stone of Jesus Christ. Give him your life. Put your faith and trust in him. He stands before you, having died for you and raised again and says, Trust me. It's simple. And yes, it's exclusive. But the best roads always are. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, feel strange to say this, but thank you, God, for your exclusivity. Thank you that you have included us in that you didn't have to exclude us. You died so that we might live I ask, Lord Jesus, today that you would speak to our hearts and move in our lives that we might respond with faith in you today. It's in your great name we pray. Amen.